To go up market, you have to be able to deliver something extremely high quality. And not all productized services are able to do that or seem to want to do that. Invest in what you know. It's like start businesses in what you know, right? Invest your time in business opportunities that you know. And that's the thing to me is like for anyone out there who's in the earlier stages, it's all about why do you have a competitive advantage in any given space and making sure you're playing in a space that you do. Welcome, everybody. We have Sam Shepler here from Testimonial Hero, and we are going to be jamming all things productized services. Sam, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be here. So you and I have met on, I think we met on Twitter and I remember seeing your bio and it was like, speaks about productized services and built Testimonial Hero, a productized video service to 3 million in revenue and all that. And I was like, yes, okay. And then I started following your content and had so many aha moments. And I'm like, totally agree with this, what this guy is saying. And obviously, as you know, on my channel here, we've been talking about productized services for a long time. And I think there's still a lot of confusion as to what it actually means, how to execute it on services that have layers of customization like video and a lot of preconceived notions on the thing. So this episode is to break down a little bit of your business, but also having been in the game, your views on what's going on with productized services and how maybe others should be thinking about it. Sound good? That sounds great. And yeah, right back at you. I've enjoyed a ton of your content as well, both on Twitter and obviously your YouTube. Appreciate that. Real quick, for those that have never heard of Testimonial Hero, can you give us like the, obviously it's a productized service around testimonials, but like, what is it? How did it come to be? Absolutely. So Testimonial Hero, we are a productized service for creating video testimonials that help B2B marketing teams close deals faster. One of the things that we really try and do is like, we're not trying to be the arts and crafts department. We're making videos that our buyers can really tie into revenue, which is important in any you know, marketing service, any productized service that is like more on the creative side. And I think that's what a lot of times like video agencies can struggle with. I actually, how it came to be, I mean, I've been basically an entrepreneur in the video space in one shape or form since I graduated from college about 10 years ago and maybe more now, I guess, um, but at least 10 years ago. Once you have kids, we, we forget how long these things are. Yeah, exactly. So basically I started a video agency while I was still in college, left school. It basically went full time on that because I had a little bit of client base built up and pretty typical generalist agency doing all sorts of type of videos for all sorts of businesses. And after a couple of years, really realized it's really hard to grow and scale beside beyond a certain point. Basically, like I as the owner had to be involved quite a lot in a lot of different projects, because when you're kind of reinventing the wheel every time you you always got to be in there making sure things work correct. Um, had the opportunity to actually have a small acquisition of that company in 2016, sold it to a PR agency who was looking to bolt on a video production department. That was a nice, you know, little outcome there, all things considered. And then tried to start a software company that didn't work out because software is hard. And I realized that that's a whole nother story. I think it's like the classic thing, like you get done during your first agency, you're like, ah, oh, fast is better. Software, it's so much easier, right? Yeah, it's like, uh, the grass is always greener, right? It's like software people want cash flow and profit and like agency and productized service people want recurring revenue. And that's, you know, how you kind of, but so basically the software thing didn't take off, you know, after a year or maybe a little bit more because that acquisition wasn't, you know, a life changing amount. I was like, all right, well, I I have to pay some bills (laughs) eventually. So like I basically was like, all right, what can I learn or take away from that, from my previous experience in my agency? And I had been hearing a lot about productized services toward the tail end of my agency experience. I think that was like when the productized services term was really getting thrown around, you know, 2014 onward. I definitely remember um, discovering a lot of like uh, Brian Castle stuff back then, which and kind of thought of like, oh, what could I productize from my previous video agency? Right. And one of the the things that I thought about was like, what is the most valuable and the most scalable? What has the highest basically like willingness to pay from our client base? And what is also something I can put a process behind. And that I believe I originally got that idea from 
actually of that whole kind of like chart of like mapping out plotting like valuable versus scalable. I believe I initially first got that from a book by Mike Michalowicz called The Pumpkin Plan. Really funny book title, but it was a really helpful book to me at the time when I read it and would recommend it for anyone who hasn't read it. Haven't read it in years, but it definitely helped me at the time. And yeah, so basically that's how I ended up with testimonials. I had a genuine appreciation for them and how powerful social proof is. Fast forward to, you know, 2020 COVID happened and our main video testimonial service, mostly on site, like in person filming, that couldn't really happen because of COVID. Obviously, we kind of re- launched a remote offering and that we executed very well on that remote video offering, figured out a way to like do things differently, which I think is really key. Like it's said so many times, but it's so true. It's like you can't just be better. You have to be different. So we really focused a lot on like how to innovate and do things differently and delivered a really unique way to create exceptionally high quality videos in a remote environment with a really easy process to the client. And that just really blew up in, in 2021, especially the combination of, you know, zero interest rates plus our market timing. You know, we ended up growing almost 300% and we were 400 and something. I'm looking at the plaque right now on the Inc. 5000 that year. So like we were one of the fastest growing companies in America in 2021, completely exploded. And obviously there's pros and cons to that. You know, it's, it's really hard to grow to triple. You know, we went from basically one to, 3 million that year in 2021, at least in booked top line revenue. And just a lot to like triple a services business in one year. And then since then, you know, we, we've been, um, I guess, kind of integrating that growth and navigating like a really obviously tricky, somewhat tricky macro situation with our main market of B2B SaaS. When, you know, we went from like a zero interest rate environment to like a very high interest rate environment and kind of like the whole VC winter. And now I think I'm feeling really great about February 2024 when we're recording this. Like I think the future is bright for a a lot of folks in the agency space and we're sort of coming around fingers crossed cautiously optimistic about the macro situation going into this year and i'm more excited than ever about this year for us at least me too. Excited for you and the general, the agency market. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And so, you know, for those watching now, Testimonial Hero, over $3 million a year in revenue, which I think I personally, you don't hear a lot of, and maybe it's just because they don't talk about it, but like, I don't see a lot of like true seven figure, multiple seven figure productized services. And you did mention that you guys play in kind of the B2B SaaS space. And something that you said before we started recording that I kind of want to dive into right away is because as you told me, yeah, we work with companies that have employees employees of over a hundred. I was like, you know what? I know he does testimonials and we need testimonials. I'm like, I never see anything targeting me, which obviously makes sense because I'm I'm smaller and, and you go upstream. And what I think as we were talking about, you don't see, again, a lot of productized services going super premium, let alone into the mid to enterprise markets. Can you talk through a little bit of like, did it, was it always that way or where did that and when did that happen? And is that a strategic decision? Yeah, it's a really good question. Question. I think the key is that to go up market, you have to be able to deliver something extremely high quality. And not all productized services are able to do that or seem to want to do that. Um, because it's very hard. Like it's very easy to deliver something that's productized in average or productized and mediocre. You need to actually innovate a lot of different things uh, to deliver something that's productized and high quality. Like it's not the natural order of things, right? So like you need like to figure out real IP, intellectual property around process, technology, staffing, everything, like how you sell it, like literally, again, speaking to like that value innovation, like you need to do some real value innovation. So like, I love doing that. To me, it's like a puzzle to unlock. And I think it's a huge opportunity. Like I think enterprise companies love things that are productized. They also can't stand things that are mediocre in quality, right? So the opportunities for going up market and getting those bigger budgets is you're having the the productization but also the innovation on your end to make sure that the quality is still there. So question, because like you made a comment earlier that ties to this where a lot of people look at, and I forget if this was before we were recording or not, but you made a comment about productized services, especially for those that are around like the creative services, you know, where you see like the classic like design pickles and things like that, where again, those are lower ticket items. So you can touch on that if you want. But the, some of that seems really like, I mean, there's so many video editing, productized services now, podcast editing. And a lot of those in some ways sometimes feels like it's just a, 
glorified packaging of your labor. And there is no way for the owner to measure if this thing is working or not. It's just like, hey, do you like how the video looks? And something that you mentioned in your description of Testimonial Hero, which I hope people take away is you you said we help B2B marketing teams close deals faster, aka shorting the sales cycle. So like, it's not we produce video testimonials. It's how do we use video to shorten a sales cycle and make you guys more money? That's honestly whether you found that curious to how you figured that piece out, because at the end of the day, all these people, I think, especially if you go enterprise, they're expecting some sort of outcome because they're going to need to justify it at some point. And when I talk to some of like the regular agencies that end up in that like full service ad hoc, we do everything. They're really just an outsourced marketing department that's way more affordable than having an in-house marketing department. And that's how they're being valued. Are you cheaper for me to have the eight bodies for the price of one? And that's sort of the measurement if we're being honest. But then it's like, oh, well, you're producing these videos. Well, how do videos increase the sales cycle and make us sell more? So can you talk to the it looks good versus do we think all agencies, all productized services need to produce some sort of measurable result moving forward, if not already? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. I will say Design Pickle obviously has been very successful. I think they're probably like very successful. Ten million dollars or so. Like I think they're over 20 now. Wow. I got personally yeah. mentored by Russ for a little bit. Great guy, beautiful vision, and like knew his lane, right? He's like, we don't do this high end stuff, we do this low end stuff. That's what the service is for. Uh, because that's actually his background. So like your background was video, his background was his agency was churning out brochures and like flyers, and so like it's what he knew. Yeah, which I think that's also a key point. The saying, like, invest in what you know. It's like, start businesses in what you know, right? Um, invest your time in business opportunities that you know. And that's the thing to me is like, for anyone out there who's in the earlier stages, it's all about why do you have a competitive advantage in any given space and f- making sure you're playing in a space that you do. Like for testimonials, I had competitive advantage in video production. I had also been quite good at B2B sales and marketing overall. All of those things kind of combined. But yeah, I guess coming back to the positioning and like revenue and showing ROI. Like I think it it totally depends in like to all the success of design pickle. Like they are basically like staff augmentation. And that is also really good to sell. I think, I mean, it it works, but they sell on saving big on creative services, uh, basically, which is very attractive. And they, and it's a different business model. Eventually we might move in like a staff og direction, but like if we were, if if for us to move in that route, it would be more like, we're going to be your whole, your social proof department basically. And we'd have to do a lot more than just video testimonials. And basically, I mean, at the end of the day, as you and I have also talked about, like the most important thing is like making sure your cost to deliver or your gross margin is sufficient. And after that, at least from like a numbers perspective, like as long as you have a 50% gross margin, like you're going to be fine. You're going to, you have a pretty good business and, you know, assuming you have a good lifetime value of the customer, like as as long as your like business metrics are fine, you got a huge opportunity on your hands either way. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to come back to gross margin because I think we've said the word enough times that I think we actually need to circle back and say, for those listening and those that think they know what a productized service actually is, we it seems like we both kind of have a, it's a little bit more gray than everyone makes it out to be. So how do you define currently what a productized service is? I've, over the years, I've worried like less and less about the definition because I don't think it, there's any single definition. It, it, and it's really more, in my opinion, about being, it's like, how productized do you want to be for your your goals and the outcomes you want to achieve. And like your the level of productized you are can definitely change over the course of your business journey and as your goals change. I actually think going from like zero to a million, it can be very, very as fast as possible. I think that's very helpful to be very productized. Um and maybe zero to a couple million. I think you know to where we are, you know, right now, you know, three million, a little bit more. Like I actually think we're gonna become a little less productized to get to from three to ten million. From my and if I had a megaphone or billboard that I was buying to, to shout for the mountaintops about this, like my soapbox or whatever would be like, let's not be too precious about the definition and let's kind of think of it like functionally around like your goals. But that being said, I think in general, what it means is you're getting the benefits of like a product in terms of like, it's more or less the same deliverable every time and it's easy to deliver. You, you can put a process in place. You can deliver it without you. It's easier to sell without you. It's easier to price. It's easier to market it. That to me is like the main thing is like for me it's all about like the value that i get from productizing like because this is a specific product can i bring it to market? can i cold email people about it and can i get a response because like you can't cold email people and be like hey i'm a video agency like do you need any video help you know like but 
But if I'm like, hey, like, well, hold on, real quick, please, please, can you hop in my email inbox and tell all of the people that are cold DMing me with that exact pitch? That right now, thank you very much. Same with me. Uh, yeah, exactly. Do you need video stuff? It's actually kind of ridiculous how loud the cold email has gotten, like in terms of how many cold emails we all get these days. Maybe that's it. We'll touch on that. Yeah, it's like to me, it all comes down to what I want to achieve, and often prioritization is a good thing. Like, and for me, like I want to be able to, you know, create an ad that can convert people to book a call. So there needs to be some sort of offer on that or like send a cold email. Like there needs to be some sort of precise value proposition. We solve this problem for you. That is is a really key thing is like, you know, cause people are, people really only care about like the problem they want solved. Um, basically the productized service element is like you're productizing all the service to solve a very specific problem or opportunity. Yeah. And I very much agree. And I think, you know, you mentioned the pumpkin plan. I believe, I know this book came before the pumpkin plan, but where I first heard the term and I have yet to trace anything further back than this was Built to Sell by John Warillo, which was about a creative agency for all of the creatives that think stuff can't be productized. And they went from a full service creative firm to basically just doing logos. People were like, oh, but how do you just do logos? It's not like they're giving the same logo every time. Like it's, but it's, they boil it down into every time we do a logo, we move through the exact same five step process. We never deter from those five steps. And it's always in those five steps. And back to your point about process and like your intellectual property on like your process might be different than someone else's and that might actually be a competitive advantage or the differentiator. And so if you're not accentuating why your process is unique, you know, you could be sitting on something and something that we said earlier and you said based on your needs, how I've always kind of interpreted it was like a continuum or a spectrum. And Jack Butcher from Visualize Value has this really great graphic where he has like on one side, it's service. And then on the other side, it's product. And then in the middle, it's product service. And he says, service is work without a process. And he says, productized service is work with a process. And then a product is a process without work. And it's like, it's this sliding scale, right? Like how productized are you? Because like, we can all go buy a you know, box of cereal off the shelf at the aisle. And it's like, the ingredients are the ingredients, the ratios are the ratios. You can't just go and be like, oh, hey, Fruity Pebbles, can you go like customize? Can you add a few more what whatever to it? Like, that's not what's going to happen. Um, And so like, I always kind of think about it like that. And there obviously is in video, like wiggle room, probably in the creative part of the process, but to the boundaries, the container in which you do that work is probably very defined to avoid the common, I guess, unproductization mistake of like scope creep and scope seep. So I think the continuum, the how productized are you is a really interesting question because you also ask the, what do you need it to do? If someone's like, I despise being involved with clients, clients, well, you'll probably lean way more product than you will service, right? And thus your price points will probably be different. Maybe you will sell without sales calls versus, oh, you love client interaction. You want to charge a premium and work with fewer people. Well, then you might be more towards the service side. Let's not focus on the definition, but let's focus on like, you know, where on this continuum of like, what are you trying to create exists? Which brings me to, you mentioned the the price points, sales calls. You made this comment of, you know, you see a lot of people do productized service where it's like there's try to buy from the site and you said why not try to engineer the economics so that you can afford to have a sales call like what's your take on like productized service and selling it via the phone because it does feel like a lot of people even that I talk to part of the desire is that they think they'll be able to do it without a call or that people will just come to their website and click I, I wish it were that easy but it doesn't seem to be yeah it's a really good point and I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually gonna say like I was gonna bring up that as well I think the reality is is a lot of people get stuck in a situation where they price their product just low enough that, and with, sorry, they price their product as service just low enough that they think they might not need a sales call, but they end up having to do sales calls 80% of the time anyways. But now they, they don't actually have the, you know, other than the founder taking the sales calls and not feeling the cost of that, they don't actually have any real economics to the business that would at scale. So like my take is like, let's embrace reality, realize that most of the time you probably will have to do a call unless you're really something very simple. And by the way, the more social proof you have, the less likely you're going to need to do a call. So that can be a big part of your strategy. Like if you have a great brand and you have really great social proof and really great video testimonials, yeah, you might be able to deflect a lot of those sales calls, right? But the reality is like most people are still going to have prospects that want to get on a call, but then they price their product so that they hope people wouldn't. It's like a non-starter. So, and then the other thing is like getting on calls 
sales, you know, is a huge opportunity to just sell bigger packages and learn about your customers and figure out what they really want and sell them more stuff. So my thing is, uh, you know, everyone, I think there was a, and especially in like initial productized service, like era of productized, like 1.0, it's like, everyone was like, oh, this is great. Like sales are just going to roll in. We're going to put a buy button on our, on our site. Now we don't have to get on those pesky sales calls. And like, obviously most of the time, you know, it didn't work like that for most people. And my thing is like, rather than try and sell something so cheap that you think you don't need a sales call, like try to sell something that's appropriately priced so you can actually afford not only you as the founder going on a sales call, but eventually someone else like as employee, a salesperson also going on that sales call. Okay. So we're going to use that statement right there because I think a lot of our audience are even our clients are kind of in that early stage sub 1 million to just maybe like 2 million ish. A, I don't see a lot of people pay attention to, oh, the cost of founder led sale versus, oh, I would love to not, I would love to have a salesperson and they don't equate that to the economic model of the business. And so can you talk, talk to that and use that as a, maybe like a jump off into gross margin? Cause like we're really starting to get to like, how does this thing actually make monetary sense? Yeah, hundred percent. First and foremost for bringing on like a, a, a salesperson, eventually having a significant average order value or, or significant lifetime value allows you to bring on a salesperson and pay them more weighted commissions in, in, on a commission basis, which is very helpful early on because you as the founder can pay someone a relatively lower base in a higher percentage of commission. I Some people claim you can do pure commission. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but that's a that's a different topic. If you want my opinion on pure commission salespeople, we, we, we actually have done all commission. And when we do and bring in the next salesperson, we're shifting to base plus. Yeah, I think it's not impossible. It's just harder to find great people to that will stay with you for a long time. If, if you have them on pure commission, that's it, right? So there's that aspect of it. There's also before we kind of make our way to gross margin, there's also the how much you can afford to spend to acquire a customer. Because if you or your competitors, like whoever can afford to spend more to acquire a customer is going to win. You're going to be able to outmarket you significantly, which also, by the way, ties into gross margin because ultimately for services businesses, you are thinking about your lifetime gross profit from any customer uh, and making sure you have at minimum um, three times the cost that you're paying to acquire the customer, you will make back in lifetime gross profit. For example, if a revenue from a lifetime customer is 60K and you have a 50% gross margin, that means your you know lifetime gross profit, um, again, we're talking lifetime, it doesn't have to be the initial sale, but lifetime gross profit on that 60K is 30K, which means you can spend basically as much as a one to three ratio of that. So $10,000 to acquire that customer who's going to give you 60K revenue, 30K lifetime gross profit. And then if your competitor can only spend 5K and you can spend or less, they can only spend a couple thousand dollars and you're spending 10K, you can just do all sorts of different marketing channels and marketing tactics. You can send people, you know, amazing gifts. You can take them out to dinner. You can do so many more things. So like people don't really think about it as much, but like the lifetime gross profit that you have from your customers, like really either restricts or or enables all your different marketing activities. And then again, like whoever in the space can spend more to acquire customers is going to more often than not actually like become the, the largest uh, player in that in that space. Yeah, totally agree. I think a lot of people even like, oh, I don't even want to do paid acquisition. And it's like, okay, there's still a cost to acquire. Like if your acquisition vehicle is posting every, every single day on LinkedIn and outreaching a handful of people and then getting some of those onto a call, like that has a cost that can be calculated and it should be calculated to understand, well, what is the cost to get someone on the phone and to get them to become a client? And so whether you pay ads or pay in time or labor for the exposure to these eyeballs and the interactions, it's like there's still a cost. And I've found at least with our clients and you know, our clients have varying services from one-off productized offers into you know recurring type deals. And at least in my own marketing journey, I see a cost to acquire anywhere from like a thousand to sometimes like 5k as like most service-based businesses are somewhere in there. So like if you only charge a thousand and you pay a thousand, now we're waiting until month two before we even, you know, are, are turning a profit. And I think some people don't pay attention to those things at all. And they're like, why is everything feel so tight and strapped and I have no wiggle room? And it's like, well, that's it. <laughs> like that's, that's the reason. hundred percent, you know, because the economics aren't
aren't there. So this goes into the, you made a comment, if delivery or gross margin and our friend Marcel Petapa, who's been on the channel before, calls it delivery margin, is above 50%, you're pretty good. So tell us what is gross margin? How does one, cal- how should one in a productized business calculate their gross margin? Yes, 100%. So gross margin, in my opinion, and as I've you know learned over the years, is the most important line on your P&L, you know, on your profit and loss statement. And you know one of the reasons for that is because gross margin is like really your unit economics. Like we'll call it delivery margin, right? If you're selling back when we started testimonial here, we were selling our on-site video testimonials around $6,000. It was key that it would never cost us more than $3,000 to deliver. Them. And that includes absolutely you know everything that goes into it. So your gross margin or your delivery margin is all of the cost that it takes to deliver any piece of work on a unit basis. And so that includes obvious things like for us, there's obvious like how many hours of a video editor does it take on average? How many hours of the project manager does it take? What software, you know, are we, well, that would actually go in the monthly, which we'll talk about. So like you want to like look at it from like an atomic level, hypothetically, okay, like, which is usually mostly about people's salaries. It's like, all right, with this deliverable or this month, I'm going to, here are all my costs. The most of the cost in a, in a product as service in an, or in an agency are, you know, people costs. So you can kind of be like, all right, it's going to take, you know, Sarah is going to be, you know, three hours. Bob is going to be six hours and like their annual salary is this. So you, you start to like calculate it. Or if you're using contractors, you use like what you pay the contractors, whether it's hourly or project based. And if you're doing this is where founders and actually get tripped up is like they're like, oh, my gross margin is great. But then they forget that they are doing 25, 30 percent of the work on every unit of deliverable. Right. And then they don't calculate what it would take to replace them. You can't inflate your gross margin by forgetting to calculate your market rate, your replacement rate, right? And, you know, people are like, great, that's all well and good. But like, why do I actually really care? And like, the answer is, if you think about like a pie, you so like the revenue comes in, you're at 100%. If you chop more than 50% off immediately on the cost to deliver, you're very hard to actually reinvest and grow the business as well as be profitable. Like you're basically going to be forced, whether you know it or not, and a lot of people aren't aware of it, but like they're being forced to decide like, do I want to actually have any net profit left over? Or do I want to invest and grow the business and hire more? And I'm talking specifically investing in non what would be called investing in SGNA or also called OPEX, like investing in, you know, a salesperson because sales is going to be an OPEX, not in cost of goods sold. It's like you can basically choose if your gross margin isn't sufficient, you're not going to be able to invest in sales and marketing and be very profitable. You got to like make a choice. And like for some people that may be fine, like they are not looking to grow much past seven figures. They don't want to build a marketing team like they're OK. But if your ambitions are to grow and scale and like remove yourself, bring in a general manager like and you don't have any room left over in your pie to do that and pay yourself, it's just it's the numbers will not pencil out. So really like gross margin being that there's true unit economics, that is really hard to adjust. You have to kind of get it right and you can obviously work on it over time, but it's very hard to like radically change without making massive you know overhauls to the entire business. Whereas like a net profit, there's a lot of things that you could adjust and cut when you need to have net profit. You could always trim five, 10 percent of kind of discretionary things below that gross profit line, as, as people have found out. And that is actually what a lot of sophisticated agencies will do is they do not focus on net margin or EBITDA. They don't focus on EBITDA until they get to above 20 million dollars or however they focus on like, great, we're going to reinvest everything into to the business, grow aggressively. And then whenever they want, they can cut back that growth because those are discretionary expenses and they still have their revenues. At that point, they've got critical mass. The snowball is there. The snowball is already rolling. And then they cut back on their reinvestments and the snowball keeps rolling. But now you have a 20% of 20 million and you have $4 million of EBITDA. Whereas if you were trying to pull EBITDA the whole time and play the EBITDA game, you know, your agency is going to be much smaller. So it's like, that's a little bit of a whole nother story. But basically, that's why one of the reasons why gross margin is so important. It's like truly the indicator of the long term potential and the growth potential of the business. Also very important if you ever want to sell your um, your agency or product or service one day, like gross margin is is one of the main things that any savvy acquirer is going to be looking at. Because again, it's like they're going to buy your business to further grow it. And if you don't have a strong enough gross margin, you don't have enough room to reinvest in growth and be profitable. So yeah. Do you think that's without most people knowing it that if you actually aim towards more of a productized service, you find that they're more profitable just 
because of the nature of it being more of a specific offering. It's not offering the farm. There's not like as much customization or ad hoc stuff. Like you see so many of these like full service, which are really just ad hoc agencies that are like, oh, client A gets this, client B gets that, client C gets this. It's really difficult as you like, if anyone just listened to how we talk about gross margin, now you throw in 15 different types of services, 12 different contractors at different day rates. And like each of them are spending different amounts of time and you have some doing a lot over here, some doing less over there. It's no, to me, it's like, how are you surprised that you can't even track, right? Like, and thus you have almost zero profit. You're sitting there like, why is this business killing me? Yet I still have no money. Do you think that the gross margin is literally just maybe why people have naturally fell into product, more of a productized service? It's a really good question. I do think to your first point, I think most people don't think about gross margin in general. Like, you know, most people are th- only thinking if you ask most agency owners or productized service owners, you ask them like uh, what their gross margin is, they'll tell you their net margin because they're not even thinking about, you know, I've been there. That's just the way it is. People think about like, oh, what's left over at the end, right? That's, but that's your net margin, not your gross margin. But I do think that in general, productized services in focusing on a single service have a propensity to be higher, to have better gross margins because not uncommon for agency that offers a ton of different services to have service lines that are actually fully unprofitable. They just don't know it. And they actually have other service lines that are quite profitable that are propping up those other unprofitable ones. So like in general, yes, I would say the other thing being that a lot of times product services and having a very defined scope and a really good process to follow can allow you to make better leverage of uh, near shore international talent, you know, lower cost basis. So that can absolutely help your gross margins a ton as well. Yeah, I love that. Okay, I'm going to pivot because I have been having this thought that having multiple conversations with other founders. And when I was listening to a podcast that you did, you had made this comment that you had hired a GM and you said there's something about how much better things have been since you hired a GM. And one of the the, I guess, reasons I hear a lot of people choose a productized service is this like, I mean, I even say it in my marketing, but I don't like I don't always tie it to productize is have a business that can run without me. But then you hear them say, I just want to be the CEO. And it's like, well, a business needs a CEO to run. And so if you want to be a CEO, the business still runs with you. When you said the GM, I've been thinking about, well, I see a lot of founders that go and hire a CEO or have a GM and they have someone else that's actually running the business and they truly are removed or above whatever you want, however you want to define it. And so can you talk to why did you bring on a GM? How has that gone? Maybe how should other service providers be thinking about a hire like that? Because I think... I think a lot of us think that we have to be the CEO or that we should, and that might not even actually be the best role for you. And then what is your role now that there is a GM? Yeah, it's a great question. I, so there's so many ways we can unpack this, but I'll say first, I think a lot of people kind of just have heard the saying like, oh, I'm like a, a zero to one guy, or like, I'm really good at getting things started. And it becomes kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And ultimately, like no one likes doing the boring work to like keep growing the company after it's off the ground. Like, but like sometimes it's just, depending on what you want to do, like that's what you do. You know what I mean? So like I would much like often like having shiny object syndrome and going off and starting another, a bunch of other small businesses or like new businesses. Like that sounds really fun. But like, to me, it's, it's more of like, uh, I guess like a delayed gratification thing, or like, I just believe in the future of the company. I I think too many people have, I guess, like a bit of a cope maybe around, like they don't give themselves enough credit. They just, it's like the whole thing that, you know, Hormozy talks about how Hormozy used to say, Oh, I was bad at math. I'm going to stop saying I'm bad at math and I'm going to be really, really freaking good at math. And like, it's the same thing as like a lot of founders sell themselves short. They're like, I'm only good at this or like, I'm not, you know, it's really up to you. I think that's one thing. I think a lot of people be like, don't believe in in themselves enough or to grow as an entrepreneur, because a lot of people are like selling this dream of being able to have a GM and, you know, start your next business and stuff, which absolutely can be true. I would just encourage people to think about like, maybe you can do more than you think and, and like starting, you know, zero to one all the time. Like that's that's fun, but like growing something further than you think is actually also rewarding. And I say that with someone who has the most traditionally entrepreneurial shiny object syndrome like ever. So I think that's one interesting thing. In my situation, though, you asked about like the GM and such. So basically, so I brought on my, my GM and he started in 2022, like January 1st of 2022. And he joined me, he joined our team, I think as like a account manager in like end of 2019. So like he promoted him from within and he's fantastic. And at the time, um, I kind of brought him on because I was like, I might want to start another business, like the classic thing, right? Over time, I actually realized I was like, once I had like, I was almost like, I want to see if I could get the business to run without me. But like, once it did, I was like, I actually don't really want to go go 
anywhere. Like, you know, so it's kind of one of those things where you have, at least for me, is like I had to like achieve it to like prove I could do it. But I actually like there wasn't really what I wanted. Like I, I still love the business. And actually, I do think like it's very hard to just hire a GM and have your business keep growing without you because there's something about, you know, a founder around like the ability to take risks. Your GM most of the time like is not going to be like the risk taker. And like you do need where the risk comes reward. So if like if you want to keep on an exponential growth curve or like a serious growth curve, like probably not going to get that with a GM if you want to leave completely. Because frankly, like that's not what the GM's for. The GM's really for like running the day to day, making sure your train stays on the tracks, all that good stuff, which is very important. You can't like ask them to be bring them in and ask them to like bring the same energy. And again, just like risk taking that a founder might some things that only you can do. So for me, like now my GM operates a lot like a, a, a probably like a COO uh, in terms of running like the entire operations and day to day side of the business. He does a really fantastic job making sure the day to day goes as normal. Things actually, you know, get done and operationally, you know, we have operational excellence and that that allows me to launch new business units, see the bigger picture, have a really clear what I feel like is a really clear path to eight figures over the next four or five years and like do that type of work and then also parachute in whenever I can add a ton of value like this right now I'm very involved in redoing our sales process that's some place I can add a ton of value so I really like it but also gives me the flexibility like when I need time off or like I took 45 days off when both of my kids were born for attorney leave so like stuff like that like I like that because like I can get the lifestyle benefits of being able to have the business run without me but right now like I couldn't be more excited about where the business is going either so like I'm not trying to do anything else at the moment other than coaching a few agency founders and project service founders. Yeah, yeah. When you have that free bandwidth. I mean, I think the interesting thing about, like you said, you coach some people as well. And for the longest time, I had these two flagship programs, but they're both heavy group with a little bit of one-on-one. And last year I started taking a small handful of one-on-one clients on amount of new ideas and like intellectual property. I'm like, oh wait, we should do this or we could do that. And like, we're now refining, creating new tools and assets. So I think there's something to, as the founder who created, and like you said, like we're the risk takers, we're the ones that kind of have that vision and innovation, we'll be the ones that probably are likely to experiment. Having the room to do that and even borrow and get ideas from people that you're coaching because you have the room to do that without sacrificing the current business is really phenomenal. I mean, like it kind of got me back in love with what we were doing in a whole new way. So all the more reason to have something that is systematic, you know, obviously the right team in place to help you run those things. Speaking of, I think we got just a couple more minutes. Tell me if we have enough time for this. So obviously you guys do testimonials. I believe an interesting take on social proof and where it's going. We're in the process of redoing our website. And for years ago and really kind of faded, we had done like client interviews that are like 45 minutes long. And as I'm like kind of talking with one of my coaches, he's like, when's the last time anyone watched a 45 minute long client interview? I was like, that's a great point. And he's like, yeah, you see like the quick TikTok client testimonial highlight reel. And I was like, yeah, I see a ton of those. So can you talk to social proof? Obviously, you mentioned sales process gets easier and faster if you have a lot more of it. So what social proof is working? What do you see is not working? What should we know about social proof? Absolutely. It's a great question. I think in general, social proof has become more important because of evolution in the way that uh, especially B2B, but really all buyers research and buy these days. And it used to be that people would talk to a sales rep early on in their process. Like they would be like, oh, this looks interesting. I'll talk to the sales rep. But that really doesn't happen anymore. And people people want to do their own. Basically, like any buyer for any industry is a lot smarter. They have access to a lot more information than they used to be. A lot smarter, you know, well-informed they used to be. And they're going to want to do more research on their own. That is the big thing is like Gartner did some, some big project here. And it's like basically the point is like by the time your prospect, your buyer speaks to you, nowadays, they're already 80% of the way through their buying process. So they're really speaking speaking with you a little bit more as like a confirmation versus the old days, people would trust salespeople at face value more and kind of the salesperson could like lead them through the buyer journey. Now it's the area of the self-serve buyer where buyers are self-serving. So in the old days, a lot of especially B2B companies would save their social proof, like their case studies and their video testimonials and all these things for really the end of the buyer journey, which was great when people were talking to salespeople, then they could, you know, have a call and then send their case studies. But like in this new kind of inverted world when people are doing more of their own research, if you don't have that social proof throughout that first half of the buyer journey as well, they're never going to actually get 
to that sales call. It's really important to understand, first of all, who are your buyers? Like, what are your buyer personas? Because people know, like, and trust people who are like them. If you have a bunch of great video testimonials, they don't really actually represent the future or the current state of like where your offer is going. They're not going to be that effective. So like there's one first layer of, of strategy is like aligning the buyer persona, your current strategy, which sometimes you need to update that, right? Because your strategy shifts often. Secondly, it's really understanding what I call the, the QFDs, the questions, fears, and doubts that your buyer has really at every stage of the buyer journey. Really understanding what are those QFDs and can I have a catalog of all of them? Do I know what they are before the sales call? Do I know what they are before they even heard of us? And before they've even heard of you, they might really be more like, why do I even need something of this category? So it's like more sometimes about evangelizing the category or kind of evangelizing the problem through the voice of a customer in a credible way. So really understanding like persona, what are the questions, fears, and doubts? And then instead of you marketing and selling to them, letting their peers express those answers to them. Because at the end of the day, you know, we used to trust salespeople. Now we trust our peers. So whether it's asking about recommendations in a Slack group or, you know, looking at reviews or it's like when you say it, it's marketing. But when your customers say it, it's social proof. So that's really the whole philosophy. And then just getting that earlier in the buyer journey than you used to have to. I love that. I don't know if you have a take on this. This is my last question on this and we can wrap up. One thing I noticed, this was both in my own consumption of seeing other people's testimonials, as well as when I would go to try to capture hours was for a long time. And maybe this is some inside baseball, but hopefully this is helpful to some people. I'd see other people that like arguably would be in a competitive category to our business or similar adjacent. And they were like always touting the big revenue wins for their clients. Our clients would talk more about like time saved or non-clear monetary wins. And for the longest time, I was like, we suck. Like, why are we not getting people to like share? Like, I know that they're making more money, but like they're not talking about it. And like, I was actually making myself feel bad because like we're not good enough sort of conversation. And then what's funny is when we started doing late 2022, going into 2023, we started doing a lot of past client and past customer research as well as active. And our best clients, the ones that have stayed with us forever, they all valued time, freedom, less chaos. And those were the things that they actually wanted to hear more of. And they weren't until they dove so deep into our content that they're like, oh, yes, he is helping them with those things. Because I thought I needed to shove the revenue number in their face. But they're like, I love revenue, but like I care more about this. And that totally changed. I think a lot of other people maybe think like you have to have your clients like always financially winning. Is there anything that you can add to like, you know, you guys have done this a ton. I'm sure they're not always sharing. We made more money by 10%. Like they're sharing their experience, like how the delivery, oh my God, like they saw me, they took care of me. Do you see those becoming more almost equally as valuable, I guess? Yes. Short answer. Yes. Longer answer. You hit on something really important, which is that ultimately some of the best customer stories are when the customer is the hero of the story, not your product, right? And it's about transformation that you help them achieve in their role. And maybe, you know, for us, it's like we do a lot of sit, we do a lot of videos for our clients when their clients say, we want to highlight how we, you know, help change this person's career, right? So we, thanks to using our software, they were able to literally get promoted and change their career trajectory, right? So, cause at the end of the day, like, yes, I mean, it's revenue matters, but it's not the only thing, especially if you're selling to SMB, you know, cause like speaking to like SMB, it's like at the end of the day, it's like, well, why do you want revenue? You want to create wealth? Well, there's multiple types of wealth. There's time wealth, right? It's like, that is very important to people like control autonomy, control of your own time, like the space. So like in your situation that applies and in some ways, like, yeah, you help them create, you know, revenue or wealth, just a different type of wealth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. I love it. So uh, you mentioned that you do some one-on-one coaching and stuff like that for folks in, in this area. So like if someone's listening, that might be a potential candidate, who's the right fit for that? And then where can everyone go learn more about you guys and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I like to work with like one to three founders at a time. My full job is still CEO at Testimonial here, but I really enjoy coaching. And if anyone's interested in it's one-on-one, it's not cheap, but if you want to find out more, you can DM me on Twitter. It, yeah, one-on-one calls, uh, 60 minutes, usually twice a month. And the type of person that it's a fit for is really someone who wants to, you know, is ambitious and wants to grow and, you know, be, and wants to be where I am now in, in a few years. Right. And then like, that's how I've always operated. Like I always try and find coaches who are, I'm like, all right, that person's like where I want to be in two, three, four years. It was where I was, where I am right now, not too long ago. So they still remember it. 
they can actually give me good advice. And like, I think that's very important. And yeah, I've, people have passed that on to me. So I like to try and, you know, help out there as well for other folks on the come up. You know, if you're doing, I'd say like at least 500K in revenue under 2 million, two and a half million, and you're looking to increase that. Yeah, give me a shout. Twitter DMs is great. It's just at Sam Shepler. Perfect. And we'll link that up in the description below. Sam, this is actually our longest, most in-depth face-to-face chat ever. And I feel like I've had these level of conversations with you a bunch already. Thanks for sharing your story and all of your insights. Guys, if you're interested in the topics that we cover here on this channel, definitely check him out on Twitter. He shares a lot of amazing content that I think would be relevant and in alignment with what we talk about here as well. Thanks always, Sam. And we'll chat with you soon. Appreciate you. Thanks, Greg. Sounds great.